Lu Shun habitually agitates for a more Western progressive uh, perspective in his own country. In the era of revolutionary China, he is nudging for uh, a, a breaking out of traditional Chinese uh, ways of life, traditions that have been in place and kept China at the, uh, essentially at, at the forefront of Asian power structure for millennia at this point, but it is now starting to slip behind um, in a more, a, a relative to a much more rapidly modernizing, industrializing, westernizing uh, Japan. And uh, Lushan has always been part of this more international set. He was a. Uh, he had gone to school in Japan. He had. Uh, he he had been a uh, somewhat prolific translator and uh, magazine editor of ideas imported from the West, and just always trying to break uh, the Chinese people out of its provincial traditional ways trying to show that there are other options out there so he was a uh, he was a powerful voice within that revolutionary era as the chinese communists were coming into power and starting to shake things up and uh, theoretically revolutionize the way things get done um it is in this environment that Lu Xun produces his longest uh, story, which is the tale of Ah And here you can see him dealing with a lot of the same uh, themes that he was in Diary of Madman, and really all of his other work, where he is pushing for a uh, reconsideration of uh, the classical Chinese tradition. Uh, he is very much satirizing in an almost enlightenment mode, uh, the uh, the inherited culture of Chinese society, and uh, he he uh, just like he does in Mad Men, where he switches register on uh, in the beginning of that story, there is the the very formal, uh, old-fashioned uh, Confucian introduction to the uh, to this story which is written as a kind of medical uh, uh, case study and then switching on a dime into the actual diary which is told in a very local vernacular very much a street argot of uh, of the time that is strikingly dissimilar to the formal traditional Chinese IQ works in that same way, just in this, just in the title, which is the name of the uh, the main character. IQ uh, being a dimin common diminutive, Q being uh, well, he, it was he identified it as the Roman Romanized English letter Q, uh, which would stand for a variety of uh, different pronunciations and names that uh, in the original Chinese, uh, but in the narrative he says, well, you know, I, I, it could be this, it could be that, I'm not really sure, and he's very conspicuously vague about it, which when I read that, I think, okay, that means uh, he's pointing out when everybody, whenever a writer is very conspicuous about something, even about something he's trying to necessarily evade saying, uh, that means that he is actually pointing a spotlight on that fact and saying, look at this, look at this, look at this. So, uh, Q. Uh, Q here is a kind of, uh, it, well, it's, 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 it's an unknown, essentially. It's almost uh, more like a mathematical formula, the X factor, if you will. Uh, uh, Q is a very vague, generic type, uh, and we'll get to that, but that idea of his name being such a key part of his identity, one of the few real facts we have about him, uh, is uh, is significant. Identifying him in a kind of liminal space between East and West. Uh, he is an outsider. 
um, to conventional, the conventional Chinese uh, society, the, the highly hierarchical Chinese society. He is just sort of there. He doesn't really fit in. And you can, you can go, you know, you can clearly extrapolate from Aku's own, uh, or from Lu Shun's own, own life of feeling like an outsider within, Japan, uh, within Chinese culture and all of this stuff. Um, but the story itself is very curious. It's a very funny story. It is, it, it is essentially a satire. Uh, there are points in it which, uh, which are just hysterical and harken back to a kind of uh, picaresque quality. Aq is kind of a, a young vagabond, a rogue, if you will, very much in that picaresque tradition. Some critics have said that, well, in this case, the, the Q kind of sounds a bit like, uh, well, maybe Quixote. Um, it has a certain uh, traditional feel from that European uh, uh, precedent. But it's a, uh, it's a curious character. He, uh, he begins, the narrator begins, just saying, you know, for a couple of years now, I've had it in the back of my mind to do a biography of Yo Aq, but whenever it comes right down to it, I've always had second thoughts. And then he just goes on and gets lost in this long debate among himself uh, about, well, what kind of biography should he write? Should it be a, uh, what is it, uh, a narrative biography, a family biography, um, you know, all of these, uh, a bunch of different segments, and uh, all of these other questions about how to go about composing it and framing it and articulating the general story of this person in a particular literary tradition. He is trying to fit it into a literary tradition, trying to fit a human life into a somewhat cookie cutter idea of what, uh, what defines a life. Um, he is caught in the conventions of literary tradition and he cannot seem to break out of them. And that, right at the beginning, that is the first thing we're told. Rather than get started with the plot and have a nice, fun adventure right off the uh, right off the deck, you are dumped into this rather abstruse uh, discussion of literary genre, which is a bold way to charm an audience. Um, but it's a uh, the story as it is has that sort of fitful feel to it. There is a very loose plot structure throughout. It's very episodic, again, kind of like the picaresque tradition. But even in that, the, uh, the storytelling mode is very indistinct. Uh, it's very digressive. The AQ is not very clearly situated. Uh, we're given very little description of him. We, uh, a, a, a few fleeting things here. He has a scar, like so many other literary characters, going back to Odysseus, uh, that may or may not have some significance, but it's not particularly developed. The, uh, the, the story itself is articulated through uh, very vague prose, where it seems to be moving towards things and building sequences and creating uh, uh, creating a kind of narrative through line, but other times it just seems like he's yabbering on forever. There's very little uh, sense of plot development as it goes along. He is a, a in the most general terms, it is the story of Aku, a young man in a s relatively small village um, who uh, is sort of on the outside. And he's a little uh, disreputable. He is a sometime thief. He, uh, we see him be, uh, you know, awfully uh, un... Uh, well, undisciplined, a little selfish, a little dishonorable, uh, quite, uh, well, he, he's, a, he's a criminal from time to time. He, uh, he's uh, a little immoral from time to time. 
he uh, he thinks nothing about just hey look there's a uh, there's a young woman hey would she have sex with me uh, we, you know he goes up hey let's have sex it's an awkward opening line uh, th this weird perspective of a human being coming through he's just sort of like bouncing through life mainly because he is not one of the chosen few in the village he is generally put up against these other characters who are alternately called things like uh, I oh I forget the names off the top of my head right now but uh, they are the uh, they are the the uh, the favored first sons of the first families of this village and it is clearly a satire of sorts on the uh, the hierarchy inherent in Chinese society which is very rigid in its uh, in, in the firstborn son inheriting everything and always being the uh, the prominent one and there's very little social mobility the uh, the firstborn son is generally the best educated gets all of the resources gets funneled into uh, a, a government job which is very uh, lucrative and very prestigious and everybody else is just sort of fending for themselves and IQ has no family connections we have no idea really who he is he has, you know, a rather questionable moral code. He is not one of the establishment. The establishment is all stacked against him. They are quite hostile to him. Uh, they uh, and he is quite resentful of them. And it is, uh, it's a sign or, or it's a story as it moves along of great frustration on his part because he always feels like he's getting the raw end of the deal. And he, really he is uh, you could argue very clearly that he you know he's exacerbating that by his behavior and if he were a little bit more honorable perhaps he would be respected more but he's generally not and where does that fall is that on him as an individual or is it on the society and this is one of the key aspects of modernism. How much can the human being break out of society? The realist tradition would say that the society determines everything and he is just the cog in the machine. But modernism puts it a little bit more on the human being and raises the person up to say, well, you know, uh, how can I do this? What, what can I do? throughout we are as we're trying to sit through and find the plot um, we uh, we find it, it we find the prose itself quite a challenge quite frankly at least I do where it is often quite chock full instead of just lean uh, uh, action driven uh, storytelling you're often given very digressive, very uh, thick-tongued prose that chokes on alternately uh, Confucian sayings and quotations and from the from the the established traditional classics of the age, literary classics, and also on the other hand, uh, folkways uh, the the common wisdom, the, pa uh, the proverbs and parables and uh, sayings of ordinary people. So you're, you're hearing this profusion and quite often you're getting through and trying to find like uh, what one thing means and you're being batted around between these two polarities of what the classics would say and what the folkways would say. Um, interesting, uh, just a quick excerpt here um, uh, now bear in mind gentle reader of three things which do unfilial be the worst is to lack posterity which is a little quotation provided in italics and has that cute little posterity spelt with an IE at the end which makes it sound old-timey in English and I assume is old-timey in Chinese. It's classical Chinese. This is a quotation 
from, uh, I don't know, something traditional. Uh, and then, too, you also remember how the classics tell the exemplary concern of Zi Wen in those days of yore, lest the ghosts of the Ruao, 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 Ruao I don't know how to pronounce that, clan so go hungry, woman and man, a great human tragedy indeed. Then we'll see right off quick that Aku's thinking one as a matter was, as a matter of fact, thoroughly in accord with the sagacious morality of our classical tradition. He, now, I'm not sure what that whole passage honestly is saying, because it is just choked by uh, this overbearing classicism uh, weighing it down. The, uh, he is trying to think in terms that are uh, that are steeped in the literary classics of the day, because that's what respectable people do. Uh, that's what the people in power do. That's what the establishment does. But he doesn't have really the background. He doesn't have the education. Uh, he cannot compete on that level. And so he is uh, left out in the cold. He has no alternative. He has to fall back on then his native instincts, which are almost always uh, bad. <laughs> he, um, uh, he has a very uh, uncomfortable understanding of his place in the world. He is constantly lying to himself and he will compliment himself. If he gets beaten up, he will walk away feeling like the victor because he tells himself it is. And so much so that it, it becomes sort of a, 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 a com it's a comic thing throughout. But over time in China, I understand it is uh, to be uh, an IQ or something like that is, is, is sort of a, uh, it's a code word by now in the culture for being a little divorced from reality, a little full, so full of yourself that you don't understand what is going on around you because you have deluded yourself to such a enormous degree. Uh, insert political joke here. Um, that contrast, however, between uh, native intelligence or common sense, I should say, and the classical learning pits, uh, sometimes they are pitted one against the other and neither one necessarily comes out all that well. The established classical model is matched against the, uh, the folkways model and often to point out the absurdities of either more than to exonerate one over the other. Um, when revolution comes to this little village. Um, it is alternately uh, uh, feared and taken advantage of, depending. And what becomes very funny is how little it actually changes anything. Um, the uh, <laughs> For the people, you get a sense that this is a fairly remote little village. It's not a particular hotbed of anything. The, uh, the first families of the village are probably just, you know, little nothings in the larger scale of things, but they're considered the local aristocrats, um, especially the first sons. Um, but from that perspective, they see the revolution the Chinese Communist Revolution coming, and it's uh, it's a curious thing, but it doesn't seem to really affect their lives in any material way, um, by any objective measure. Uh, chapter eight: uh, the Way villagers felt more reassured with every passing day. The word from town was that although the Revolutionary Party had indeed taken over, it hadn't made any changes to speak of. His honor, the county magistrate, was still the same man, though they called him something else now. Old Master Selectman had also acquired some, some sort of new label, the way villagers couldn't keep track of these new revolutionary titles, and the same old lieutenant was in charge of the soldiers too. 
So even something as sweeping and monumental as the Chinese Communist Revolution it can't really change China. Their ability to crack out of their own cycle and habits, uh, to shed their, uh, their tradition in any meaningful way just falls apart. There is no real difference from pre-revolution to post-revolution in this construct. Within this village, the same people who were members of the establishment before soon rise, after a little hustling, soon rise to become the leaders of the Revolutionary Party. The revolution that was there to overthrow the establishment uh, is now once again lifting up the members of the establishment. They cannot shed their tradition. They cannot shed the weight of the conventions that China is caught in. And Aqiu is, or rather Lu Shun, is lambasting this again and again, just ripping people apart for their inability to uh, see the truth. Aqiu uh, becomes essentially, Aqiu is arrested. He, he becomes a revolutionary of sorts and whatever, the revolution starts to go a little bit bad. Some of the people start stealing and looting and the powers that be need a fall guy. So they settle on Aq. <laughs> Aq goes through this, uh, this sham trial. He is imprisoned. He is forced to uh, uh, sign his name to a confession. He admits that he does not know how to write, so they're struggling to get him to like just draw a circle so that he could write a cue at the end of a confession. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's absurd. But they're putting him in and out of jail, and it's very obvious how this is going to end up until once they get the confession, they're going to just use that as a, uh, as a death warrant. They're going to kill him. Um, but what is striking is his imperviousness to the reality of it. Um, the second time Aq was shoved into the cell, it didn't seem to bother him much at all. It's just going with the flow. Again, sort of a picaresque thing, uh, just like, oh, okay, this is what's happening to me now. Uh, he's totally rootless. He has no sense of identity, so it's very difficult for him to feel particularly uh, uh, any particular affront in any meaningful way, although he reacts to people resentfully off the slightest provocation. Uh, didn't feel much at all, for he had come to the conclusion that in this old world of ours, there must be times when a man is supposed to get hauled in and out of cells, and times when he's supposed to draw circles on a sheet of paper, too. It just when he phrases it like that, he's talking about signing his own confession to, to a crime. Uh, he, he cannot conceive that what this means. Now, you can go crazy with the idea of, well, writing is somehow he's struggling to write and he cannot do that. Uh, and so he has no grasp on the reality of this piece of paper this, that he is signing with writing on it. Uh, you can you can go nuts with the uh, with the interpretations of that, but uh, what what drives home is very much the inability to grab to grasp anything actual, anything true. Uh, it's all just uh, ephemera to him. It's all just you know what does this mean? He is stuck in his own routines, in his own habitual ways of seeing the world. And so any new information is just impervious to him. Um, after the uh, conviction, suddenly it dawned on him. It couldn't be anything else. This was an execution. Aqiu panicked. Everything went black. There was a loud ringing in his ears, and he slipped to the edge of unconsciousness. But rather than falling in, he stayed there, teetering on the brink. On the brink, he's always on the brink. Lu Shan is always on the brink of something. He's never stable. 
teetering on the brink, remaining in this state. He was by turns terror-stricken and perfectly at ease. As if, as his mind flickered on and off, IQ concluded that in this world of ours, there must be times when a man is supposed to get hauled away and have his head chopped off. It's just an absurdist fatalism. He's just going along. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, I guess this is the way it's supposed to be. It's always been this way, so this is the way it's supposed to be. I have no power to break out of this cycle. I have no power to even apprehend breaking out of this cycle. So he's hauled off to his own execution. Along the way, he's torturing himself, trying to come up with uh, an appropriate uh, way to behave, and so his uh, his, uh, his, his go-to is literary. And, and he says that, well, you know, if, if uh, I, I should, in good classical heroic form, uh, be singing an opera as I go to my scaffold. And uh, it's, it, he doesn't know any because he hasn't had the education, because he doesn't have the training. He, he has no words in that tradition in that convention he has no access to it and so he's you know just sort of dumbfounded i think he comes out with like a single line that he makes up uh it's uh, he cannot break through <laughs> the cart continued relentlessly fought forward amid all the shouting Aq turned and looked at Ama Wu once again it was apparent however that she had not even noticed him for she was lost in contemplation of the novel looking foreign rifles the soldiers were carrying so he turned and looked uh, so he turned back and looked again at the people who had just cheered uh, the girl that he was vaguely interested in fleetingly is sort of caught up with what the foreign rifles of the revolutionaries. Uh, again, that nation, uh, that notion of the foreignness and the outside perspective, and uh, where is where is our center as a culture? Um, how do we position ourselves with regard to the outside? Um, he is beheaded. But before Aq, well, he starts to scream, help. But before Aq could get it out, everything went black before his eyes. There was a loud ringing in the ears, and he felt his entire being crumble like so much dust, which is the fate of humanity as he sees it. Um, now, we've been clinging to Aq throughout this narration, so it's almost as if we're getting, uh, as, as, as if once he's dead, we're going to lose uh, all voice, but there is a little bit of a uh, an epilogue after that, where it goes on and talks about the reaction to it. Um, everybody seems to come out okay, except for Aq. Aq was just a inconvenient or a convenient fall guy, and everything else sort of goes on afterwards. Uh, as to the public opinion, the inhabitants of Wave Village were unanimous. Everyone agreed that Aq had indeed been an evil man, the clear proof of which could be found in the fact that he had, in truth, been executed. If he hadn't been bad, then how could he have gone and gotten himself executed? Never question the system. The system is always good. The tradition is always good. The convention is always good. You cannot question it which is a core belief of Confucianism. They can't see that it should be questioned. Public opinion in town was something less than favorable too. Most townsfolk were disappointed. A shooting had not proved nearly so much fun as a good old fashioned beheading. Worse yet, in his role as condemned criminal, Aq had given a miserable performance, paraded through the streets all that time, and not a single line of opera. They had followed him in vain. So they were disappointed. He was shot as opposed, as opposed to beheaded, so that's the mention of the rifles earlier. But, uh, you know, we're supposed to, this is like a parade, and at the end we get to see his head chopped off and roll around. Maybe we'll go play soccer with it. Um, the folkways won't be disturbed. 
the expectations of humanity won't be jarred. Uh, it is a relentless and savage satire on human nature. And it does have that sort of enlightenment feel to it that way uh, as a piece of cultural critique. But it is also very much a modernist uh, work in the way it goes about its aesthetics, the way that um, it repeatedly, through literary conventions, through the very fabric of its own telling, uh, undercuts conventions and literature itself. Uh, the portrait is one of humanity drowning in tradition, in the set ways of doing things, in the set ways of understanding things, in the set ways of interpreting and receiving things, like literature tradition, art, culture. The prose, as I have said, is choked with classical uh, quotations and homey proverbs, uh, the sayings that your grandmother would tell you on her knee. And uh, it's, it's hard to really sift through those to get to the through line of narrative and of meaning and theme and all of that other stuff because it's all this other stuff encrusted on it which is writ large the modernist position to culture which had become so overstuffed at this point. Uh, characterization itself is uh, somewhat suffocated underneath these same conventions. We don't know that much about IQ. His uh, details as a character are very sketchy. Now, uh, Lushan has been very famously quoted as saying that, well, he didn't want to give any particular uh, handle or specificity to anything about IQ because he wanted everybody in China to identify. He was going for a universal application to that character so that everybody would feel that, well, okay, they're kind of all that. So he becomes, IQ becomes, a repository for the entire culture, which cannot grasp reality and is just being sacrificed to some abstract notion of tradition and the way things are supposed to be. And all the other, none of the other characters rise up either. There are uh, so many of them are dismissed with general terms. They, they become reduced to types. The character named the budding talent, the, the, the favorite son who's going to, who is doing so well on his exams and he's going to be, you know, make everybody so proud. And he is the establishment pick to be, you know, their, their very best, the meritocratic ideal. But he's not an individual. He's just part of that same system. He's another element of the oppression of IQ. Uh, the plot itself winds around in this kind of uh, episodic, uh, meandering way. It goes along kind of like a folktale. It has a, a charming little yarn feel to it where Everything sort of links together, but there is an almost improvisational feel to how IQ moves through the episodes, as if somebody is just sort of sitting back, telling a long story after a, after a long day. Maybe they're having a little drink in front of the fire, and everybody's gathered around and say, ah, let me tell you something. And it has that informal but nativist feel that feel of the common that is everything this story is railing against. Lu Shun is saying we need to strip off so much of what we have inherited. We need to shake off the burdens that have come down from us through traditional sources, both through the classical educated uh, top-down model, but also from these backwards uh, populist uh, common sense models that are resistant to any real change either. He is caught in the middle of that. 
he sees China caught in the middle of that. He wants China to rise out of that. And he is trying to use his literature, funny and charming as it is, but he wants to use his art as the engine for pushing China into the new era and pushing humanity all over the world, burdened with its own traditions and its own clotted ways of doing things. Pushing humanity to take a fresh look at the world around them and try and construct something for themselves. That's the mission. That's Lu Shun trying. It's it's not a very convincing case that he had great success. As an artist, yeah. As a social revolutionary, not so sure.